think we, we, could, we can start? Okay. Hello, so um, I'm Anna Maria. I want to welcome you all here today. Um, I find introductions and conclusions very terrifying, so um, it's riddled with mild anxiety and confusion, but I'll do my best, and I'll speak about three things. The first thing is 2020, the year. Um, maybe it's a thing of my generation, but we've kind of waited for this year to happen. It was fed to us through really bad films, um, of which I was going to talk about, but I'm not going to anymore. But um, it was also on another level fed to us by 2020 visions, um, especially in the school. At some point, we had to <coughs> read through a 2020 vision planning um, and then try to find an alternative. And that always felt a bit of a, a, bit of a trap. Um, so I think to many of us, 2020 means that we kind of need to redirect ourselves to the present moment um, and kind of figure out what are the forces that keep making us think about the future, right? Because um, that feels like a, like a distraction. Um, the second point is about images. Um, mainly the images are not um, images anymore. Um, and the simple, really simple point is that um, images now look back at us. So they're no longer representations. Um, representation itself is in between this kind of state of total collapse and this kind of vast infinity. So I guess the question of the program, and we've done that through the exhibition I'm going to talk about a bit, but also today, is not to really ask like, what is an image? Um, the question is elsewhere, um, in maybe a pixel or in a system. Um, and most importantly, the question is how we navigate or how we kind of break through these already established or programmed links um, and how we exist in this year um, as producers and receivers of images. And finally, about the program, in many ways, today started a long time ago in the school. Um, the school has never been about, well, I hope, architecture with a capital A. The way I think we understood it as students is more about, was a way of developing, a way of seeing, a way of searching, um, a way of doubting yourself, um, the world, architecture itself, and then reconnecting these doubts and redrawing them, searching for them, um, and what is the architect's portfolio. Um, there are many units that are talking about images in the school, writing about images, working with images, producing images. So it's been an ongoing conversation that we're actively participating in. So today is the afterlife of many afterlives. Um, most recently, um, an afterlife of a brief that I taught with 18 students. Um, we looked at the work of Harun Faraki, particularly his works Parallel and Serious Games. The question there was how to not write essays, but essay films in a history and theory course, and how to make work and at the same time resist or fight back with CGI images, gamification, technology, and the technology we're using itself. So in many ways, it's an afterlife of Harun Faraki's work, but I'd like to think more an afterlife of, and this is not me saying this, his ability to address incredibly difficult topics, um, worlds between machinic and human labor, the digital and the analog, with a precise pragmatism, some, if no hope, yet still with underlying humor. So finally is an afterlife of the exhibition next door. In pursuit of images, I <coughs> want to really thank Moad, who took on some of the forces, complications, and questions described by Faraki's work um, and recontextualized them amongst parallels and alternatives. So thank you. Um, and there is a line in the program text that says that we're aiming to bring visibility um, to this kind of new form of invisible textures of images, but I'm kind of, kind of want to go back on that. I, don't, I do hope that we have more <laughs> aims together 
and we do that through our doubts today. And by the end, we'll have more questions and more doubts. Um, I was gonna do an Oscar thing where I thank everyone, but um, I want, okay, I wanna thank Moad again. I wanna thank our guests for being here. Um, and I wanna thank the students um, and the program team, Jasmine, Paulina, Inez, um, everyone else, Oliver in the print studio, etc. Stern, Josh, it's turning into an Oscar moment. So um, I feel like we should begin now. Yeah. Yeah. So I will thank you. Thanks. All. Thank you everyone for being here. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to introduce the first um, panel in conversation um, with Ali. Aladawi, um, who is a curator, researcher, editor, writer, and critic of moving images, urban artistic practices, and cultural history. He's curated a number of film programs um, and seminars, including Serge Dene, a hom homage and retrospective, and Haron Faroqi, dialectic of images, images that cover, uncover other images. And he also works as a curator. With Paul Kacha, he curated exhibition The Art of Getting Lost in cities Barcelona and Alexandria, and was one of the founders of Tripod, an online magazine uh, for film and moving image criticism, and the editorial team of Tel al-Bahar, Dar al-Bahar, an online platform and publication for urban and art practices in Alexandria. Um, so please join me in welcoming Ali. Um, having been here, um, um, I think um, I'm trying to in, in my presentation and then open the conversation about it, that I'm trying to uh, reflect on the idea of um, documentary films inside the Wild Cube from the perspective of some works, of my research of some works um, by Harun Faruqi. So I, I'm I'm gonna start from a uh, quote uh, from the, uh, one of the conversations that I really appreciate between Harun Faruqi and Peter Sterl, which was in February 2011 that it's published online in uh, uh, Kaleidoscope uh, Press. Um, uh, I quote, Harun Faruqi says, indeed, and now uh, one might ask why so much of documentary filmmaking, which has been driven from television, has migrated to the world of art. It was, after all, an art magazine which approached us and asked us to hold this discussion. Why is documentary been taken up by the art world? Both of us make our films with funding for art, with money from film festivals or themed exhibitions. Most likely it is that documentary films give art license to claim real world uh, relevance. Hito Sterl um, answers, you mean something along the lines of mimesis, like a, a real urinal in the white cube? Harun answers, yes, of course, the documentary film is a magical imitation of reality. And what is more, it's something that has been found, not made as with an objet trouvé, uh, don't search, find, says Godard. The renunciation of authorship masks a hidden cult of the author. He who know, finds, finds, knows how to judge and, it's, uh, and is therefore that the true author. There is a long tradition of this in modernism. The role of the curator or DJ or film programmer has been much celebrated in recent times. Uh, end of quote, I'm starting from uh, the idea of uh, what kind of reality that could be uh, discussed in this quote, uh, what we could find in um, uh, most of the works of documentary films by Harun since 80s. In, in Europe and the US um, market the beginning of neoliberal post fordist economies, societies of control in which in which the hegemony of large corporations, advertising and marketing departments over the media led to media representations, domination over our work and lives. The result was countless images promoted as, uh, promoted as 
except uh, exemplary ideals of every human act. Images we became required to emulate, to push, to both get promoted or even accepted in the labor market and to be rec recognized as good citizens or socially fit individuals. This is where HR departments, workshops came in. They train and retrain through role playing exercise aimed at the training how to, s to simulate and perfect the best way in which to, uh, to approach customers. Games based on uh, role playing are integral to the following works by Faruqi, which is mainly on the dominant archetypal images like uh, indoctrination, how to live in, uh, in West Germany, or, uh, in FRG retraining, the interview, present images, serious games, immersion, especially, or uh, parallel. Reflections on militant images. Since 1995, militant images have become an essential component of the archive fever trend in contemporary art practices. It is an indication that the struggles portrayed in such images are finished and fully integrated, that they have become part of the past to be displayed to be displayed as artifacts in museums and art institutions, as Bruce Groys argues in his text on art activism. It is also an attestation to the blocking of the public sphere and the historical defeat of national liberation projects and militant leftist movements in many places across the globe. So it's a form of aestheticization Lots of exhibitions and films have become spaces for nostalgia, mourning the time of political engagement, resistance, and the guerrilla fighting through the reproduction of restored images from the archive that glorify these struggles against colonization, fascism, capitalism, dictatorship, uh, and patriarchy, and highlight how closely they were connected to each other across the global south, Europe, and Japan like from the 60s to the early 80s. Upon examining, examining such works, the question of archival appropriation is almost always raised. Restored militant images made by other artists are often juxtaposed against new images of the same, of the same sites. Now vacant or teeming with people caught up in their everyday routine, oblivious to the struggle that once took place in the same spot. It is a clear lamentation of what once was. Meanwhile, we rarely ever see works questioning such images of militant violence, attempting to contextualize and problematize them in order to raise the questions we need to be, ask, to be asking. How were those, these movements defeated? How can we deal with their res uh, residuals? How can we suggest a revival of the struggle or maintain its continuity so we can produce our own militant images today? For example, one of these works that it has this questioning of militant images, the uh, work by Mohammed Swed, uh, um, which is a portrait of Khalid al Kurdi, a Syrian trans woman living in a double life in Beirut. She, she, was, she was a fighter in the civil war and living this double life with a man in the street and a woman at home. In 
2011, a Franco-American artist and filmmaker, Eric Baudelaire, who often cites Adachi as a major influence of his, uh, of his work, made a film about the Japanese director who was himself involved with radical armed leftist groups using the landscape technique as um, and theory of landscape he devised. He named it, it, uh, he named it uh, Baudelaire, the Anabasis of May, and Fusco, Shogunobu, Masao Adachi, and 27 years without images. In the film, Adachi is present as a subject. His voice over narration superimposed on the landscapes and Japan of Japan and Lebanon. He tells the story of how he decided to su substitute his camera for a gun, joining the Red Army, then going to Lebanon to fight for Palestine. Decision fraught with danger and drama. He recalls years of disappearance, hijacked att hijacking attempts, burnt images, and reflects on the relation between filmmaking and guerrilla fighting. He then travels back to his hometown with a new vision to complete the journey. In, 2000, in 2017, Baudelaire made a new analysis, this time following the journey of Aziz, a French Salafi jihadi from his Parisian suburb across Algeria, which he describes as a home, Egypt and Turkey towards Aleppo, where he fought with the Nusra Front before returning to France, only to be arrested by French authorities. Baudelaire's Aka Jihadi can be viewed as a reproduction of Aka serial killer in a contemporary context. The Aka serial killer, the film by Adachi, as here to the subject is absent and is also uh, is only represented by his state records. The film weaves urban, the weaves urban landscapes with document landscapes. Wiretap transcripts, police interrogations, and surveillance reports raising multiple questions about the practice and aesthetics of landscapes. When should the subject and their choices be present? When should they be absent and only represented? When can landscape theory be seen as a critique or a confirmation of sympathy? Meanwhile, Harun Farouki was interested in deconstructing images of a production process of a space and the environment in um, environments in new liberal control societies and libidinal economies designed to enhance and encourage cons consumption. He depicted the design process of shopping malls in the creators of shopping worlds, work environments in new product and virtual reality system used in military training and Serbian serious games. In parallel, Farouk's last video series, he investigates and attempt to develop a critique of 2D, 3D virtual reality, computational structure uh, of uh, computational structures of video gaming systems, the mizan scene of which is inspired by various cinematic representations, in turn production images that are even more dominant than those propagated by films, considering the ubiquity of video games since 90s. Computer and PlayStation games, which are a major part of algorithmic representations, act as sentin systems of production of subjectivity. They started with 2D, then 3D animated images where the subject was absent, only represented. Today, we have reached more developed versions of augmented realities where the subject is activated, complete with their own matrix of nerves and desires in so-called interactive games and through the notion of navigation. We are entirely immersed in computational spa spaces where the virtual becomes actual and the, abstracts, uh, and the abstract becomes uh, tangible. In the particular context, it is safe to assume that, that gun shooter games were a definitive influence on the terrorist that committed the uh, Christ Church Mosque uh, shooting in New Zealand earlier this year. Many factors lead to the, the young man to that moment. His white privilege, the rise of right-wing groups around the world, the, mili the militarization of everyday urban life as a result of decreasing legal limitations on the right to buy and bear arms, 
but his choice to film the attack as a live stream through the gaze of a gun shooter game using a GoPro camera mounted on his head as he listened to music that was a kind of a clear reproduction of countless video game images. 51, 51 people died, many more were injured, and though they were abstracted in computational space. Like Aziz, the, jih the jihadi in Baudelaire's film, the Christchurch terrorist had not completed his university education. Aziz had planned to perform a suicide mission in Syria, but ch changed his mind and went back to France. Here, however, the, the terrorist, a white working class man, wrote a 74 page manifest manifesto on white supremacy and the con conspiracy of the ground displacement before going on to, to commit an ideological crime, the majority of the victims of which were working class citizens just like himself. To conclude, Farouk's critique of identification and forced sympathy, which is also uh, 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 clear in serious games of the immersion that he is working on, uh, he works uh, uh, on um, uh, role playing, which he uh, operates in his uh, essay, uh, 2008 essay titled Embassy, published uh, in Haru Faruqi, another kind of embassy, 2016, is still valid. This question of force its embassy and the question of embassy is still valid. It, occur, it echoes the continuous rethinking of the Brechtian concept of distancing effect reflected in question of the position of the camera, the position of the author that Harun has often grappled with in his work. What is the perfect distance the author should take to maintain an independent critical position for themselves and at the same time avoid producing pathetic images of subjects that may be in a less privileged position. If, rep if representation, and especially visual representation in the context of cinema, is an act of violence, as Godard points out in the image book, contemporary, contemporary art practices and media are even more violent when they are accom accompanied by a, a facade of good uh, and t intentions masking bourgeoisie feelings of guilt. This is often the case when a work simply acknowledges its maker's privileged position being a white artist from a colonizing nation or a specific social class rather than produce or perform any kind of aesthetic intervention when addressing it. The other face of the same coin is work by a black indigenous or Arab artist which aim to excite empathy, playing on the same feelings of guilt. Thank you. agenda is it around let's say representation of an event is it around procuring a certain kind of empathy etc um, and so the title of the exhibition in pursuit of images comes from that Baroque text uh, on the documentary where he talks about the distinction between documentary and fiction right and he goes you know around the moment in which the documentarian when she's pursuing the subject might not know where the subject is going and so let's say the camera overshoots or undershoots and it misses and really reading that, I mean, and in that text, let's say there's a kind of more cynical and 
facet kind of her own um, irony where, you know, actually for him the distinction is also this fact of kind of like commodity fact mm -hmm. and actually how those things actually become subverted by, let's say, this big Hollywood production. But just to kind of take that thread was, let's say, one of the things around the exhibition and to think through, let's say, okay, the camera person in that place of the act of documentation, what happens when it's a computer graphic image, right? And so that in the question of, in parallel, it's like, okay, what, what possible distance could be, you know, made when actually you're, you know, it's a screen capture, right? And the camera is the very video feed that's, let's say, feeding into the thing that you're documenting, and so there's that collapse. And in a sense, what is the act of pursuit in those examples? And I think um, it's funny, we had a long um, and really kind of engaging seminar yesterday at the CRA with Naeem, and thinking through, let's say, those questions of role playing and simulation within documentary film, and maybe I think Naeem as well in the next talk will pick up on them. But in a sense, what distinguishes the documentary from fiction in terms of, let's say, the technicity of the act or the ways in which different forms of, let's say, filmmaking can begin to, let's say, produce or think through those kind of categorizations, if those categorizations are even, let's say, necessary anymore. Mm -hmm. you have some yeah, um, uh, this first part I, I of the of this reflection was was uh, actually entitled "Fiction or Documentary." On the, on the idea of of role playing because I don't um, I don't uh, like uh, of this idea of this dominance of archetypal image that people always try to simulate and you find actually that it's it's not fiction film but it's, it's fictional situations that you are documenting mm -hmm. in the documentary films but it's very fictional the, you cannot uh, you cannot talk about uh, this um, with this dominance of image, uh, the dominance of images, of image circulations in social media and different kind of images people see every day in their everyday life and how, how our lives, our, our, our situations, that it's, we are dealing with each other mediated by images. We are expressed through, expressing our feelings through images and all of this. But the, the whole thing is, I, uh, makes me not so much into this uh, uh, like real boundaries between mm. fiction and documentary um, and uh, which for me is questioning this this notion of cinema verite that this mm. search of or this search for truth it's not uh, it's not the same in 50s after this dominance of image in our lives which means that it's there is this idea of truth but we are not talking about not not post truth and all the not all the patriarchal thing of post truth and that, like there is I mm. think uh, but it's not the same um, uh, it's something that we produce it's not something static this idea of truth it, of of truth it's something that we produce and it's totally different from what was what we could say in truth in fifties and sixties before this dominance of archetypal images that people always imitate and people always simulate to for in their work, in their different life situations. I mean, I think that's, yeah, like I think it's really obviously like, yeah, like in a sense thinking through, let's say the malleability of those boundaries between like the documentary and the fiction, but yeah, I still, and this is something, let's say that was really a part of, let's say the kind of curatorial like goal was yeah. to really think, okay, what, but then is there something still there that let's say is useful when one thinks through a practice that is around documentary film. And so yeah. far as, I mean, I know that here you've shown the work of Marwa Arsenio, yeah. but I just, I mean, another work in the exhibition, Anand Patwardhan, in We Are Not Your Monkeys of 1996, in a sense, there is a use of, let's say, a genre or a kind of expectation around its documentary form, right? And so the, the conventions around the ways in which the people, let's say, um, he rewrites um, the Ramanaya epic, and there's a kind of revisionist history of, of, of a kind of India's origin to think through like different class divisions and caste divisions specifically. But it's really within that, let's say, both the convention around the kind of um, the documentary myth, which is the epic, right? And so the kind of social convention that's present in that that he uses and like, let's say, subverts. But at the same time, the method within the, sh the aspect, like the way he shots, right? It's also, it's also like a kind of 
to music that splices and it's it's a six minute long kind of he styles it as a music video um a long piece where it's he puts you know this kind of circle of people singing in the kind of in the same kind of um convention and then with moments of like street scenes etc and so there's a kind of political positioning that happens because one assumes that okay there's a kind of documentary approach right mm -hmm. and i wonder i don't know i mean i wonder if you can speak a bit because you selected kind of this image and this yeah. work with model wars because i feel like there is something around the role around like documenting something mm -hmm. that's happening that even though that line is blurred there is still maybe some piece in it or i don't know i mean what do you yeah it's uh, uh, part of this selection of the works of Wild Relatives by uh, Joanna Manna and, uh, and um, Marwa Arsani, uh, uh, who is afraid of ideology, that it's, um, I, I feel that it's part of what we could say that it's in the art space now, it's a kind of, that it's converted to be a kind of a kingdom for the alternative. Like mm. this, these lives of, it's always marginal, and, and who's afraid of uh, ideology? You are, we are talking about the mountains in the Kurdish uh, um, margins in Syria and how people living, trying to have to develop their lives uh, in agriculture, in a real relationship with, na with nature, which is not, people are not uh, uh, human, let's say, or the human is not the center of it. It's more in, uh, in harmony with different parts of non-human, uh, ag natural uh, parts of, of the lives there. And she went there, uh, it has two parts. One of that it's more as essay, the first part uh, of for the BKK go uh, Gorilla uh, uh, women fighters, which is in a way quite different from uh, the, uh, the traditional uh, uh, image of a woman with a clashing, who's always having the uh, Palestinian scarf, that it's quite different from uh, this uh, iconic image of Layla Khalid, but it's also this, um, uh, uh, it has something different, that it's how these women fighters developed uh, their, uh, their relationship with nature, with, uh, with, with different parts of the landscapes, and this, and also women living in towns, how they develop uh, uh, their lives with, with their husbands mm -hmm. with in, the, in, in these places was also was a subtle, subtle critique of the political party that it's uh, 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 managing all these lives in these towns and this, fa which is also s raised the question how this alternative very, va very far marginal uh, statuses, our uh, marginal uh, lives could be, uh, qu we could qu question in our mm. city lives, in our uh, everyday life. Because yeah, I think, I mean, it's something you said actually just um, before around like the difference between fiction yeah. as a kind of, let's say, mode and then the documentary of fictional situations. Mm -hmm. right? And I feel like there's something there maybe that's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, the moments where, I don't know if you can speak a bit around this image, mm -hmm. but also the moment where there's a kind of acknowledgement, right, of the presence of those kind of apparatus of like the, of recording and of the kind of camera function. But I wonder if you can speak a bit. Yeah, this uh, image from Respite, um, um, which is uh, uh, Harun Faruqi, uh, Dead as a Silent film, that it's commissioned by, um, uh, Film festival, but also was a screen in, in the exhibition format. So it's in a way, uh, uh, it was something. Uh, it was for me. It's I put it as uh, because I've, I've, I find it something fascinating at, uh, as it comes at the end the conversation with Hitush Terrell because it's a silent film, that it's a kind of challenging the the very bad situations of uh, of sonics of acoustics in the exhibition spaces that you put a silent film. That to like inviting people more to to go to uh, concentrate with it, but th in the same thing that it's the film itself trying to uh, to tackle the stereotype image of Jews in uh, uh, in camps, that it's uh, because it's mainly uh, uh, trying also to question the idea of the appropriation of of artists working on archival material of other artists or other. Uh, bakers, uh, cinematographers, uh, he decided to take uh, uh, 
the 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 whole footage with with uh, that made by the photographer cinemat uh, cinematographer in this as a propaganda material for that this transit camp in Netherlands to uh, as a kind of uh, trying to say that we are uh, for the manager of the camp trying to say that it's it's uh, he's doing his work and also the the inmates in this camp trying to uh, trying to show that they are living a very good life in this camp. Um, but the thing is, all of these footages, uh, as you see that it's one of the inmates is playing uh, sport and this, but trying to um, uh, also uh, deconstructing all of these footage materials mm -hmm. or the, the, the circulating materials of Holocaust and this. No, that's, yeah, and I think, I mean, as I think it's curious in the, in the conversation with, between Hito and Harun around the way in which the narrative, I think I can't remember the exact quote, but it's like when you place a narrative over the video, it's almost as if like you're placating or you're kind of, you know, um, I can't exactly the word where it's like you're, you're almost calming those images down, I think is how I understood. To find the... Uh, yeah, when the they play, when, when, and in a sense, this kind of distinction between, okay, actually when you remove the audio, I think in, 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 in Haruni talks about yeah. in those silent films when you had the orchestral score and you had the sound effects, they would drown out the reaction of the audience to the yeah. images, right, as well. And so there's a kind of, let's say, different, um, let's say, like the way in which that black cube space gets used and how the audience, let's say, gets either captured or also, let's say, erased and kind of... Yeah. Um, it's interesting, in the exhibition we have a work, um, Short Dream 2, Invitation to Happiness, which is a 2008 work by In Hung Soon, who is the only silent film in the... Exhibition. Um, it's curious because in, in the in that interview between Hito and Haroon, it's they talk about how people never put on headphones. So we have like yeah. I think twelve Each headphones <laughs> in this space. So I hope um, some of those are used. Um, but it's in in this work in in Hung Sun's work. It's incredible because for him, he thinks through. Let's say I mean he's a Korean based artist who works in documentary practice. And he works a lot on the Vietnam War and histories of the Vietnam War from the perspective of Southeast Asia. And for him, let's say there's a kind of, and this is a kind of maybe side note, but like the, just like for, and Faroqui talks about the Gulf War as inaugurating a new visual regime, In Hong Sung really thinks through, let's say, the Vietnam War as also a new visual regime within that perspective. And so the work is actually a documentary around a series of explosions that happened mm -hmm. in campus in the kind of early 2000s. But he speaks about them as from the perspective of Vietnam War veterans, right? And so there's a kind of idea that there's a genre or there's a kind of format around the way in which one experiences these things. Um, and this kind of question of, let's say, the fictional situation, mm -hmm. right? How, what does one frame and face those works? But I wonder if just to frame this kind of question um, around the, and to kind of turn it a bit around the kind of idea of like the place of documentary film and like practices that engage mm. with, with documents as well, I think, to kind of keep things a bit broad, within like, an, a, gal like a gallery space. And I wonder if you can reflect a bit around um, if this exhibition is curated or like, let's say thinking through your uh, role as both a curator and researcher around how does one, let's say, think through entering that space um, and how does one like, think through, let's say, placing of those works? What is the, what's at stake? Yeah, the, um, the thing is that if, uh, in, in my practice, so that it's um, um, like when I did a show for uh, a kind of a ret retrospective for uh, Harun Farouki in, in, in Egypt, um, actually I decided to make it as, as, as a film program, mm -hmm. not to have exhibition part that. So we, we try to take the, 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 uh, the, 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 that we take video installations in the cinema, or mm. in the cinema hall, to, uh, to people see it as to, to try to work more on this, um, um, uh, the idea of soft montage, to see two different images, like talk in conversation with each other or in the cinema hall and how this could be, um, what are the reflections, what are the questions, what of the, mm. like in the, the projects, other projects that, for example, that always the white cube is give you, um, um, still for me, that give you um, 
um, uh, the idea that you want to always to experiment something on it. Mm. So, for example, that it's uh, just uh, um, um, I was uh, I saw an um, um, uh, exhibition in Cairo. It's more for the uh, uh, food practices in Egypt, and it's it has a work which is a film, uh, a really independent film. The filmmaker do it for seven years with his handy cam, moving around the delta in Egypt, around the delta of Nile in Egypt, for seven years from town to town, and made like six hours work. Fa uh, fa it's away and it's exhibited in uh, in a black box in an exhibition, and people always don't see the six hours, but they mm. they pass by and always there is food served during the. Uh, you watch for you come, you pass by and set. You can see, I think, a uh, clip. This one? one, yeah. It's from the. So who's the? So who's? What's the name? It's of work by the filmmaker. Uh, he's a filmmaker, and it's the first time to put his work inside an exhibition. What's his name? His name is Shreve Zuhiri. He made a lot of fiction short films, but this is his first and uh, <laughs> experiment in in documentary filmmaking, like a, a like a long experiment in in um, uh, documentary filmmaking, and uh, it it was a very good. Uh, nice um, um, experiment to see this, how in a way this documentary film kind of play with the way to, to, to play with it and to ma manipulate it to put it as and to, to build a new relationship mm. with people watching it. So for example, people come to watch the work and stay to see what happened in one town and leave. Mm. And other come to, to see like uh, which, which makes half an hour and one hour and and sometimes people stay to, to watch the whole film and uh, no, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's it's curious around like modes of attention, as I'd say, right, as well, like the kind of expectation that one has when entering that space. And I think, I mean, in the sort of images, it's interesting because, I mean, on one level, let's say there was a kind of um, pedagogical aspect that it really tried to speak to, being a gallery within a university, being, let's say, the main audience and kind of the student body that enters and exits. Um, and so there was a kind of, let's say, desire to have a series of works, maybe you know, it's, it's, a, it's a dense and it's quite a compact exhibition, but it's really around, let's say, thinking through people who kind of visit and revisit, right? It's a kind of space that is um, part of, like, let's say, the routine. Um, and yet yeah, think through, let's say, that duration. And a lot of the works are short films. Um, we're going to hear from Naim, which is a six minute piece that he has in the exhibition. Um, Haron's ones are around, I think, 10 to 20 minutes. Yes. You can watch them in parts. Um, but we have, I mean, one film, Ali Atari, Theatre of Operation, the Gulf War scene from Puerto Rico, oh. which is a four hour, it's in three oh. parts, and it's a four hour um, long documentary that's oh. composed of found footage of a news, a Puerto Rican news broadcast um, interviewing her family. So it's a kind of oh. autobiographical work in, in one sense, where there's, I mean, the work is quite. Um, striking for me because it, it does this kind of strange thing where it talks not only around the Gulf War, it talks about the Gulf War didn't happen in Baudelaire, etc. But it also has this kind of, it opens up the context in so far as it thinks through, let's say, the Arabic kind of citizen in that kind of moment in the Gulf War versus the kind of status of Puerto Rico as a kind of American territory. And it thinks through those two aspects in a kind of strange mm -hmm. kind of cultural um, mediation. But it's, yeah, it's interesting because it's, four hours and it's a news broadcast mm -hmm. and you know there's a kind of different let's say sitting in and sitting out and watching moments of it that let's say there isn't or, or rather it's like a work that I kind of read as well in the sense that there are it, its entirety is kind of embedded in moments and in fragments right and then yet it can dip in and out and I think that's kind of really interesting mm -hmm. um, it's yeah I mean I think there's a lot to say. Do you have? Yeah. I love the people of the Colonies. Uh, I think. Of no, like, uh, yeah. I mean, I think. Okay. Um, we're gonna. 
there will be time for discussion I think around lunch in the in the break mm. in the lunch time. Um, and so please join me in thanking Ali, Chris. Thank and you very much. Thank you. So as Naim sets up, um, I want to introduce Naim. Naim is the only <laughs> artist <laughs> who is in the exhibition next door, and we have two performance works um, at, at midday and in, in the evening. So Naim, um, who also was really gracious in sitting with us yesterday, um, she flew here in her dolphins as well um, for almost seven hours, I think, at the seminar. <laughs> appreciate that he's uh, going to be speaking about um, his work here in the exhibition. Um, so Naeem is an artist who combines essays, film, and installation to research leftist utopias, failed decolonization of the Muslim borders. His work is on the permanent display in the UK at the British Museum, in film and dance and cinema, um, and commissioned, he's been decommissioned from independent film artists and Rush, um, International, Ireland Biennial of Contemporary Art, the Liverpool Biennial, in London, Film Gallery, the British Council, um, and was the Pana Prize nominee in 2018. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Naim. Thank you, Moad. Um, so, uh, let's see where to start. Uh, maybe I'll um, reflect back to yesterday uh, and a phrase we used, which I'll resuscitate today. Um, yesterday we were in a, I guess, six to seven hour symposium at uh, Goldsmith Research Architecture with Moad Susan Shupli, who's uh, speaking right afterwards. Uh, spending a lot of time talking about one Bangladeshi film that's an iconic film from the Bangladesh Liberation War and the very complicated position of simulations within that film and the idea of the film as a sacred object uh, that can't have any distortions. Quite naturally, sacred books came up, and the idea that sacred books are inviolable, uh, specifically the example we kept returning to, of course, is Quran and Hadith, and how they're supposed to have divine providence without any uh, distortions, which seemed a good way to talk about the films we talked about and the insertions that are um, in those films. Uh, so at some point, we referred to an essay I had written for Bioscope, um, Journal of South Asian Screen Studies, and this phrase I had used about people being converted into believing publics, if what they're watching is something they really want to believe, so if it's a sacred narrative. And then Avi Verma, who's a PhD student at Goldsmiths, um, used the phrase, I don't know if it's his phrase, but it's the first time I've heard of it, about certain kinds of imagery producing weak publics, um, uh, meaning, not sure exactly in what context, uh, exactly what he meant, but I understood it to mean that uh, a public that's so altered by the images they're looking at uh, that they may be lost the capacity to differentiate between what they're seeing and what they think they're seeing. Um, so that's maybe a good lead into um, what I'm going to talk about briefly, which is um, the film, the short film that's on display here, but also the film I didn't make, um, partially because of things I found during the research project, research process that didn't fit with what I hoped to find. Um, specifically, that film is about uh, the widely circulated story of Bangladeshi uh, fighters that in the 1970s volunteered to fight in the PLO and went to Lebanon uh, to join the PLO and fought there until the Israeli invasion. Um, and a lot of that circulates around one particular photograph that people have seen of Bangladeshi fighters in uh, PLO guerrilla uniform and whether that image, whether that image is what we think it is. Um, so Ali had referred to um, Eric Baudelaire's work, um, and so I took that uh, lead to just insert um, three images uh, at the beginning of my presentation. Uh, this is a show that's up in Tokyo right now, and there's a Lebanon connection. Um, it's uh, my film from 2011, United Red Army, about the hijacking of Japan Airlines uh, by the Japanese Red Army. Uh, and Eric's film that you referred to, Anabasis, which is about um, essentially sort of the residue uh, of that moment, uh, Mei and Fusakushi Ganobu, Masawa Dachi, and of course the absence of images partially being uh, because of the fact that identities have to be protected because there's still potential danger. Um, the Lebanon connection is that um, Eric had made his film in active uh, collaboration with various people in Lebanon, including Miren Arsenios of 98 Weeks. And so when my film about the hijacking came out, 
she came to me and said, you need to see Eric Baudelaire's film. I tracked it down. That's how we started to know each other. And, you know, we approached the Japanese Red Army and that story from two different sides. Um, you know, Eric has the absence of images, but overlaid with images, um, shot in Lebanon uh, and Japan. And then I have the absence of images, really black screen with text. Um, and it took nine years to get this film to Japan because there's so much sensitivity around the Japanese Red Army and we're very tentative and it's a very small uh, independent space, which is why we could do it. Um, and I'm just showing two images. Um, this is uh, Eric with Masao Adachi. Um, you know, Adachi said in the film at some point that it's good I was in Beirut and not in Japan because I might have drank myself to death. Um, I mean, he said it humorously, but a lot of our conversations were around um, uh, drinking and conversation. And this is uh, Adachi with Ikido, uh, Ikida son, uh, who, so Adachi has spoken with Eric before, and Ad of course Eric's made films uh, based on Adachi's concept, and they've quoted in the script for The Ugly One. Uh, and there's another film that they haven't been able to finish, but that Adachi has written. Uh, but Ikida san is uh, new to me. Um, she was an encounter of this time. Um, she is actually one of the six uh, Japanese Red Army members who were released from Japanese prison in 1977 in exchange for the release of the Japan Airlines flight hostages. So she's, for those who may have seen the film, there are these six Japanese people that are taken from Japan to Bangladesh in exchange, and she's one of them. She's one of two women. Um, she was later arrested in Romania and then served prison for, I believe, 25 years and has been released two years ago. Uh, which is why she can speak in public, but she's also extremely careful uh, about being in public. So just in case anyone's taking a picture of that slide, um, kindly don't post it on social media. Uh, but I have her permission to share it here uh, in this closed room. Um, Ekidasan, I bring her up because I also think a lot about the idea of um, regret and going back and revisiting these moments and questioning what was done in these moments. Um, She's not only one of the six people that was released, but she's actually not a member of the Japanese Red Army. She's a member of another group, but the Japanese Red Army wanted to claim her as a member. So she actually was part of a hostage exchange, which she should not have been in. And if you see my film, not the one here, but United Red Army, there's a bit of dialogue that says that the Japanese Red Army wanted nine people released and three of them refused to go. They preferred to stay in Japan and serve out their sentence. Uh, and she went. Um, the result, of course, is actually a multiplication of her prison sentence because she was maybe going to be in prison for another seven, eight years. Because of being part of the hostage exchange, she ends up being in exile in Algeria and Lebanon for many years, gets arrested in Romania, and the charge is forging a passport, which is how she could travel, for which the sentence was 25 years. So by participating in the 77 hostage exchange, she actually doubled um, her prison sentence and has only come out. And so I, one of the questions I asked her is whether um, she had any regrets about that moment and if she could go back in a time machine, what would she do differently? And, and she said, yeah, the movement made many mistakes and uh, we should talk about that actively. Um, so that makes her also a little bit different within the movements that I've looked at of the 1970s, which is that she acknowledges um, openly that maybe mistakes were made. And mistakes is a very difficult thing to talk about um, even I hesitate now because, you know, this is someone who gave a large portion of their life in prison for a particular ideal of which there's no residue left in Japan today. There's certainly no even inkling of that spirit or any of that energy. And it's uh, not even a historical artifact for anyone Japanese under 30. Um, it's obviously not discussed in any of the history books or even in popular media. Um, you know, and. If, but if you're asking someone if that moment was in error or whether errors were made, it also raises the question of whether that person's life was dedicated to something that may or may not have been in error. So it's a complicated conversation to have, and I'm also not resolved how to talk about it. Um, but it seemed a good lead-in to talk about um, this incomplete project. Um, so what's showing here is Abu Amar is Coming, which is a six-minute film about the Bangladeshi fighters in the PLO. Um, it's six minutes because it was a um, six-minute commission from the British um, Arts Council for showing artist films before cinema halls, meaning in the popcorn break. So it had to be six minutes, um, the interstitial length. But that six-minute length, which initially I thought, oh, that's incredibly short. I've never made anything of that length ended up being some sort of blessing because when I went to Lebanon for this project, what I found 
I didn't know how to make a film or didn't know if I should make a film. Uh, so the six minute film was a rescue in the sense that I didn't have to get into the messy details of that, which I, which I wasn't happy about having found, um, which is around the complications of international solidarity, the idea of volunteering for international solidarity, whether these people volunteered or not. Um, and you know, the, the object or the space of um, a pan nation, pan people solidarity, which certainly I valorize, but often is much more complicated on the ground than we think it might be. And I've used this phrase elsewhere, um, solidarity is hard work. Uh, and one of the reasons solidarity is hard work is international solidarity requires perhaps rapid, uh, usually not slow, movements to another countries to do work, maybe an analog for art practices also, where you don't know enough and you won't have enough time, you might not speak the language, but you're immediately um, pressed into some sort of solidarity work. Um, so the film I didn't make, um, uh, although Bisan, who's just walked in, and I have been working on a short clip that I'm going to show that could have been the nucleus of the film, is called The Company Fata. And the title comes from this phrase um, in an interview with the Bangladeshis in Lebanon, uh, where I asked them how they came to be in Lebanon to join the PLO. Uh, and the reply unvarnished was that they came actually as migrant labor, and they came for work, the same way that population movements are continuously happening now, certainly from South Asia to the Middle East. And when they arrived in Lebanon, they found out that their employer was, as he put it, the company Fata. That's literally what they called the Fata faction of the PLO. And that obviously wasn't the story I had gone there to hear or expected. And so I actually asked multiple times, you know, are you sure? And you'd say, yes, actually we got paid and this is what we did, etc." So then, you know, as perhaps often happens, I thought of a title for the film before I made the film and then I didn't make the film. So that's Company Fata, which is the precursor to Abu Amar is coming. Uh, So Bisan and I worked on this last night, actually, so we'll see if the sound works. Um, this is Jamal Aisa. He was a former PLO spokesperson and still is willing to give interviews. And he's the first, I mean, I guess his current PLO as well, but doesn't seem to have any official uh, duties in the current configuration. Um, he's the first person I found from the uh, Palestinian side who was willing to speak about the Bangladeshi uh, fighters. And what he said was, um, well, you'll see, he uses this phrase, the Bangladesh stage of the revolution. Uh, he says that that's apparently a phrase that critics of Fatah used, and the sense in which they used it is that the revolution has moved to the Bangladeshi stage where we're too bourgeois to do the fighting ourselves, so we have Bangladeshis in the camps. Uh, and the Bangladeshis in the camps actually started out doing the sort of labor that wouldn't surprise you, uh, driving, fixing the equipment, cooking. But later on, apparently, as it got closer to the Israeli invasion, um, they were conscripted into actual fighting. So I'll just see if the clip plays. Ah, okay, sound, I don't have. How did you get sound, Moad? Most of them, they came can people hear it if it's playing from the computer? No, it keeps, it's coming out of the speakers, but I think turn it up on your computer. Okay. Most of them, they came from the lab. Sorry, one second. Should I play it? Most of them, they came but he said this discussion made me want to smoke more. Mm. Okay, but those are <coughs> so.
So you didn't look at them, my question is, you didn't look at them as international fighters, as any international fighters. No, they're not Qaeda. I mean, they're saying that they're a national government, 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 they're a تك مثل انه مثلا من الجنسيات الاخرى شارك في عمليات ليش اقول انا في مواجهات مع الهجوم الاسرائيلي شارك في عمليات عسكريه ضد اسرائيل يعني استشهد في عمليات اللي كنا نسميها انتحاريه في هذاك الوقت يمنيين واكراد وعراقيين وكذا ما عندي علم انه مثلا في واحد يمني دخل الاراضي المحتله واستشهد بنجلاديش يا ابو انه في عندك علم انت او انت يعني ان شاء الله انا يا ريت يكون في 10 He's saying that those international also will come here to fight to make special operations against Israel to hijack a plane or to go. But I never heard about a Bangladesh fighter who did who was really like like he's talking about Barry Meinhof and Roger Panizza who did really operations. Operations, but small numbers of people. Yeah, small numbers. So, so I'm telling him he didn't look at them as international fighters. You know what I mean? Like as the same same who came. So how you? ذيك المرحلة ذيك المرحلة كانت أنت عارف في العالم كانت مرحلة حركات التحرر في العالم. صح. لما في حركة تحرر فيش حركة تحرر ترى البنغلاديش يعني إنه. بس ما كنت تزرع عليهم كهاو دي جيني أكلوا معنا هاو دي جيني يشتغلوا معنا. بالأخير هيك كانت النظرة في البداية لا. يعني عندما الأعداد ازدادت. هيك كانت النظرة العامة، أنا بكرر كلمة النظرة العامة ليش؟ لأنه اللي بده بديش ياخذ بفتح، بده ياخذ 200 دولار، طب ما إذا راح وقف حارس بناية بأمن وأمان، بخذهم. ليش على فتح يعني ليش؟ ليش على ها؟ كان مؤمن بالقضية بالقضية بس مش يعني قلت لك مش على طريقة يعني الإيمان العقائدي المطلق اللي ممكن في أي لحظة يقدر حاله أو تخطه أنت في المواجهة مع العدو. Of course they used to believe in it. Of course, but not like in Because why you have to take two hundred dollars and fight? He can be uh, work any any work and like uh, a consumer. They can work yes, more even. At the beginning, they used to look at them. He said, at the beginning, they used to look at them as like coming to help us. And all that. But when they become many and many, they sh the shift the look. And plus, they look out. Of course. هي نظرة طبيعية أنا بعتبرها بغياب يعني بغياب المواقع تبعتنا وما تشوف إلا هن صار أصبحوا موجودين بمعسكرة مواقع وال بيكوز إت واز كايند أوف فور هيم إت واز كايند أوف جنرال لوك هاو وي هاف تو لوك إيماجين سادنلي وي آر فايتينج أند سادنلي إيفرون ليفت أند جو تو ذا سيتيز أند أند ذن أونلي بانجلاش ليفت إن ذا تبرجت الثورة سو ذي واز يا إت واز لايك ستارت تو بي ا بورجوا ريفيوشن As they begin by the workers from another country. Exactly. Exactly. Um, exactly. Um, uh, but I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about that. It doesn't work anymore that a Palestinian fighter would sit as a guard in front of the uh, military base. Mm -hmm. uh, can I bring a Bangladesh? That's it. Why I have to be, um, I have to be, you know, like, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it would be good to go to the one that used to be the Bangladeshi camp. Can we go to this place? No, no, no. Can we go to this place? No. Cafe. It's the most important thing. It's a cafe. It's a cafe. It's not 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 a cafe. The question is, you drink cafe or not? You like cafe or not? I am a supporter of the cafe. My favorite, my, my... I left coffee. You had some concern about time, Ahmed? Okay. Uh, a bit, but we can have coffee. My f Facebook page is known as Sima uh, Every day there is the uh, the opening. The opening of my page. Every day my cup of coffee. Of coffee. Since the three years. Mm. Every day I will change the, the, the cup. Not mm. the same cup. Uh, no repetition. <laughs> This is the last one, today. So every day you put a new cup? A new cup, and they... Where do you get so many cups from? They brought me from everywhere, and they were... Ah, <laughs> you 
Because I started like that. Anyone come from Saudi Arabia, come from Emirates, from they choose the b b b most beautiful cars and they bring them. Ah, no, I didn't see any. No, I didn't. I was opening the page in the Arabic and in the Arabic. They put it and in the morning, I mean, it's a nice day. It's going to be according to the weather, the political. How many words are there? It's going to be with different directions. فكل يوم بشوف فنجان، واحد سالني اللي عندك فنجان؟ قلت له تعال صورني يا اخي، تعال شوف شوف انت شو محطوط على الطاولة هون يعني عينات. اه 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 قلت له تعال صور، اي واحد بيجي من الخارج من من المتابعين اصدقاء كانوا منسيين لميت الكل على الصفحة، ناس ناسيين مخيم هيك. So Bisan and I were debating last night uh, whether to include the whole social media um, portion and thought we should because he got more animated um, at that part uh, than the earlier part. Although, of course, the Bangladeshi portion is at the end of a much longer interview. Uh, you know, the people that he refers to who come from all over the world are also people coming to him for presumably PLO and Palestine memories. Um, so. The other thing to mention is that in another section, which we didn't include, he talks about, you know, the Palestinian position about the Bangladeshis. Uh, maybe not going as far as calling them miskeen uh, or beggar, which is what I used to hear when we lived in, my father was a doctor in Libya. So when we lived in Libya in the 70s, we heard miskeen all the time. So maybe the Palestinians didn't call them miskeen, but there wasn't a lot of necessarily, as he says, not a huge amount of respect necessarily. And then he says, but not me. I didn't have that attitude. Um, so there's also this taking himself out of that general position, which you can also see in the way he talks, where he says, oh, this was the attitude. They were workers, but I didn't have that position. So we meet Jamal. We spend a lot of time with him. And he essentially says that the Bangladeshi workers may have been essentially labor for hire, which in another way could be seen as mercenaries, which is, um, which is not the story I expected to find. Uh, and then this I'm going to show with the volume slightly lower because I don't have subtitles for this. Um, uh, Humayun, uh, no last name, is typical of multiple security guards in Beirut that I interviewed who are Bangladeshis in their mid-50s who say that they came over also uh, in 81, 82 and belong to PLO in this way. <laughs> I'll just speak over it. So he's asking, what are you showing me? I'm showing you my son was born in 1986. These are his papers. Now he can't come. I've applied multiple times. They haven't decided whether to give him nationality or not. I haven't been able to get the national card even though I have the birth certificate. Um, could you turn on the volume completely? Um, so he goes on and speaks about how much money he's sent uh, trying to bring his uh, son to Beirut. Uh, this is actually a quite common phenomenon. Bangladeshis, of course, all come without their partners if they have partners, and then they have no way to bring their partners over. The only way Bangladeshi women can come is also as maids or workers, so not attached to the same person. Uh, and it's quite common, actually, to be in arrangements with, uh, for some reason, Sri Lankan uh, women who are already there. And so some of these people are also in cohabitation partnerships with Sri Lankan workers, which may or may not have produced these children. Um, but this child was born in 1986, unclear who the mother is, but he's back in Bangladesh and he hasn't been able to bring her since. Uh, the point of showing this clip is that this is at the end of a long session in his um, room, which is quite cramped security guard quarters, where we're talking about his time with PLO. And at the end, he says, look, let's go outside into the hallway where there's better light, which is why we're out here, because I need to show you these documents and you need to film them in the correct light. And then we spend a lot of time with this. And then he basically says, I want you to make a film about this. I don't want you to make a, I don't, he didn't say I don't want to, but he said, it's much more relevant for us if you talk about our current plight. To which I had said, look, there are people working on that. That's not what I've come to research. And he said, well, if you want to make something useful, his words, then you should talk about our current plight, not about something that happened in the 1980s. Because as far as he's concerned, he may have volunteered or been conscripted. But even that history is of no relevance to his current situation in Lebanon. Um, rather, what he wants is a documentary that will be useful um, for the current plight.
So I did all that. I did all that research, uh, came back with these interviews, um, confounded by what I had found. And um, uh, those from Beirut or spent a lot of time in Beirut may know this place, Mezian, uh, a restaurant where a lot of us spent a lot of time, sort of a de facto headquarters for some of my friends. And the owner, Mansour Aziz, uh, who's working on his own film at the time, uh, saw my clips and you know he was translating the Arabic for me and then at some point said, why do we need this film from you? Uh, and then his exact quote was, uh, look, the body of the Palestinian uh, movement is already half dead. We don't need a Bangladeshi coming here and uh, kicking it further. Uh, we already know what is the situation and actually we're perhaps deep in um, melancholia. We don't need more. We don't need a Bangladeshi version of that same melancholia. And because he's a close friend, it of course really uh, moved me, I mean caused me to just basically put aside that project, not make the film, and instead make this one, which I'll just show a very short clip because the full film is in the show. Um, and if we could have the sound again. Uh, oh, maybe I won't show it. British photographer took that lone image in 1981, or maybe it was 1982. Buildings were already gutted, but that could have been earlier. 1973, 74, 75, any point really in the Hundred Years' War. Sumaya found a grave in the Shatila compound. She translates the Arabic for me the martyr hero Kamal Mustafa Ali, and then in brackets, Bangladesh, martyred on 22nd July, 1982, Qalat al-Shukhaif, Lebanon. In the London office, there are no more photographs. In Beirut, Bilal will speak only if the camera points away. The paradox of time and the cruelty of decline the end of the Third World International. Bilal has journeyed from Fedayeen to underpaid security guard. The word Fedayeen is pronounced the same in Arabic and Hebrew, but only in one does it mean those who sacrifice themselves. thinking about that other photo again. One more enigma inside the puzzle box. Standing still for one pose and then, just like that, 
the vanish. They were not in the Tripoli newsreel either, as thousands boarded the last ship out of Beirut, missing at journey's end, rendered into a footnote. Were they waiting for Abu Ammar to arrive, to inspect their uniforms, give a smart salute, say a few words? La intifada, c'est moi. Après moi, le deluge. I'm looking now with quiet desperation. If thousands of Bengalis joined Fatah, as is claimed, where are their traces? What about this man walking away from me? No, he's Arab, not Bengalis. How do you know? I know. Look at his walk. What about this one, the man with the gun? It could be. He does seem to be dreaming of home. Not home in Philistine, but home even further away. Could you turn up the sound a little? Thanks. Um, so just, um, I showed almost all of it, but now we'll turn on the volume a little. Um, just a few notes about the film. Uh, that song never existed. Uh, it's a fiction that I felt I needed to make um, to balance things out in terms of the melancholia that I felt suffused the film. The other thing is I use the words enigma and puzzle box, suggesting that I haven't reached the answer. But as the clip at the beginning will show you, I've reached the answer both, I think, in terms of what actually happened and in terms of what Bangladeshis living in Lebanon would want in terms of a film representing themselves. And because I couldn't make that film, at least at that time, uh, I made this short film instead, which leaves the questions unanswered, um, even though Inside myself, I know what the answers are. So the questions are presented as questions, even though they're not fully questions. Um, yeah. Um, maybe I'll end there, because I know I'm out of time. Um, but maybe the conversation will circle back. Um, just to say that, um, yeah, what Mansoor said really um, affected me, of course, but it's also laced with this idea of responsibility, which is a parallel conversation happening alongside conversations in art practices, um, which may give themselves license to go places that certain forms of documentary might not allow. Or maybe, of course, it's all mixed into one now. Um, yeah, so it's an unfinished film that was never made, and this was the substitute film. And the last image belongs to Humayun and his um, hope to bring his son to Beirut. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Naim, for the talk. Um, up next is Susan Shukli. Um, she's an artist and researcher, director of the Center for Research Architecture at Goldsmiths University of London, and an affiliate, affiliated artist researcher and board director of forensic architecture. Her work examines material evidence from war and conflict to environmental disasters. Creative projects have been exhibited throughout Europe, Asia, Canada, and the US. Recent commissioned works include Learning from Ice, Toronto uh, Biennale, N um, nature represents itself, sculpture center, trace evidence, and atmospheric feedback loops, um, a vertical cinema project for Sonic Acts Amsterdam. She has published widely within the context of media and politics as an author of the f forthcoming book, Material Witness, and she lives and works in London. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thank you so much for the invitation, Wad and Anna. And um, let me just get myself sorted here. Uh, and oh, I'll close my email for starters. <laughs> so I, I will have. Um, and, ooh, 
Okay, so I'll use this for my sound yeah. out. Is it okay? Great. Let's just see. Okay. Um, so, so what I what I thought I would uh, try and uh, talk through today is something I've been interested in for quite some time, and, and really trying to get to grips with this this kind of the rise of data aesthetics and what kinds of political challenges they may ri um, raise, but of course also um, what, a, what does that mean in terms of kind of artistic practice, and I'd like to do that. So this is sort of thinking on the fly, and I, even with Ali's uh, discussion this morning, I was thinking about this, you know, the kind of the criticism or the discussion around um, the distancing effect that we inherit from discussions in contemporary in documentary cinema today we really have to think about the kind of the frictionless zoom which would be it's a different kind of distancing effect and so the sort of the capacity to zoom through a kind of seemingly uh, this fantasy of this as I said the frictionless zoom that we move from something like a remote sensing platform into um, some uh, sort of space on the ground to me that is a kind of this is a sort of area that I would locate this um, presentation and my thinking is really trying to grapple with this um, more the kind of computational kind of realm. And I'd like to do that through um, a consideration. And Anna, I'm going to return to the question of representation versus abstraction, but of course not by way of uh, a transit through art history, but thinking about um, issues in investigative journalism and in this case today, it'll be through examples from Western media. And so, let me begin. This is, I begin with a quote. The guy that was running forward, he's missing his right leg, and I watched this guy bleed out, and I mean, the blood is hot. As the man died, his body grew cold, and his thermal image changed until he became the same color as the ground. I can see every little pixel if I just close my eyes." End quote. This literally chilling account of the chromatic transformation of a thermal image in the aftermath of a U.S. drone strike over Afghanistan was recounted by Brandon Bryant, a former Air Force drone pilot who became an outspoken critic of the U.S.-led war on terror. As the heat signature of Bryant's target cooled, his victim's body quickly becomes an indistinguishable field of monochromatic pixels that convert figure into ground. In this transition from a hot data subject to cool data cache, the distinction between image and event fully merge. Different ontological realms are remediated such, a, such that the on-screen dynamism of a wounded running man is converted into the pure electronic stasis of the screen. While the material violence of the event, a Hellfire missile strike conducted by a satellite link between Nevada and Afghanistan, was already subsumed into the visual economy of the image as a transaction conducted between sensors and screens, Brian's harrowing description of his remote but intimate televisual assassination emphasizes the degree to which the conflict zone has migrated to the operations of the screen. Yet this is not the public interface of broadcast media or online platforms that transmit stories of conflict from the field, but the informatic screen of conflict pixels, a classified screen event conducted between code and combatants. Many of our current Conflicts are characterized by highly decentralized and diffused networks as migrants flee the shifting war zones of Syria, Iraq, and Turkey, or counterterrorism measures recede into the murky spaces of black ops and secret detentions. This condition of spatial indeterminacy in combination with distributed modes of open source and participatory journalism, including video activism, grassroots media, as well as online platforms and remote sensing capacities, have in turn also rendered the geographic necessity of locating the journalist within the fixed spatial coordinates of a single location somewhat obsolete, although on the ground reporting is arguably still essential. 
Screens and software now provide a crucial portal into current events as well as innovative tools for investigative work. And to um, examples that I'm ver very familiar with and, and I imagine you are as well would be Bellingcat and of course um, forensic architecture. But computational space has of course also been central to the production of violations as practices of data acquisition and digital targeting transform subjects into patterns, excuse me, into patterns and data sets that are actionable and even executable. Despite the pixel memory that re-renders the event, each time Bryant, who suffers from PTSD, closes his eyes, the killing he both perpetrated and witnessed quickly dissolved into the field of digital abstraction, where the war on terror has found its most calculated political ally, namely in big data and machine learning algorithms. During the Obama administration, the now banned practice of signature strikes based upon pattern of a life analysis based on pattern of life analysis, took the drone war to new levels as the kill list expanded exponentially by means of data analytics. Under this practice, suspected militants could be legally terminated, not on the basis of their actions, but rather by the, via their informatic correspondence with the pre-established data mesh. So while da data abstractions do sever the effective bond between the victims of violence and a public whose opinions might waver, if confronted with the visceral aftermath of such military technology upon what are all too often civilian lives, the representation and disclosure of suffering is by no means contracted to the public sphere as a call to action or prompt for humanitarian intervention. Indeed, the live coverage of the genocidal violence that swept through Bosnia in the mid-1990s designates an infamous shift in screen theory as images brokered new alliances with perpetrators who committed atrocities in full view of TV cameras and crews, or indeed expressly for such cameras. A shift identified and discussed by media theorist Thomas Keenan in his well-known essay, Mobilizing Shame. Today we are witness to an even greater surge of images, still and moving, uploaded and streaming, that clearly depict self-evident self violations of human rights or brutality towards unarmed civilians on the part of the state, but whose rhetorical capacity to convict legal, legally has likewise failed miserably. Despite the demand for justice that such documentary images may perform publicly, when they enter into institutional infrastructures, especially legal, they cannot guarantee that the regime of representation will be adequate to the task of providing accountability or indeed result in criminal conviction. And here I'd like to briefly return to a, um, a historical significant case from almost 30 years ago, which is that, which is the infamous, um, uh, infamous uh, tape that captured the beating of Rodney King in 1991. And so I realize, perhaps given the, how many students are in the audience, this actually might not be an event that actually you're that familiar with, but it inaugurates a very specific moment in what is, has come to be called citizen journalism. So a significant historical case is that of Rodney King in which amateur, camcor amateur camcorder footage documenting his roadside beating by the LAPD was re-edited when it was entered into court to downplay the racialized violence directed towards King while intensifying the black menace of his body as a confrontational form in which violence was quote unquote naturally inscribed. The vicious assault towards King, an African-American motorist, stopped dur during a routine traffic check on March 3, 1991, was captured on tape by local resident George Halliday, inaugurating what has since become known as citizen journalism. When the analog footage was professionally digitized for its pre presentation and trial, much of the ferocity directed towards King was selectively removed thus shifting the effect of narrative from a savage attack upon King to a perceived threat of violence towards the officers. By virtue of conducting a frame-by-frame -frame analysis and stripping the video of sound, 
The jury was spared its visceral violence. An acquittal ensued and riots erupted throughout Los Angeles. Um, I'll just play a few um, seconds of that clip. It's as disturbing today as it was, of, of course, in 1991. Between, uh, uh, I'm just going to stop there. Oops. I've jumped ahead accidentally. Um, there we go. All evidence presented in court is subject to a degree of interpretation based upon the framing devices utilized, whether by way of precedent and case law or as a result of testimony furnished by experts and witnesses. However, the deliberate re-editing of the King tape pointed towards a future in which information about what is happening in the visual field would increasingly be subsumed to its deification, which is to say that the informational value of any given media resides in the capacity of its properties to be divisible, thereby allowing them to be recombined with other data sets to produce new values and thus potentially to script new narratives. Lawyers defending the actions of the LAPD didn't simply allow the tape to speak for itself, but arrested its playback, focusing on moments when the blurred and murky electronic capture of violence was of a sufficiently abstract nature to raise uncertainty as to what had seemingly transpired. Abstraction, in this sense, was utilized to open up the image content so that it would recombine with other, other data sets, specifically the aggregated history of U.S. race relations that would in turn permit a that would in turn permit a racist reading of the image against representation. Now here we also arrive at somewhat of an, a juncture. Despite the continued failure of representation to produ produce justice, humanitarian or legal, that images as evidential agents may seek, their very status as, status as disputed objects has also provided the means for redressing wrongs and challenging legal determinations. In my own artwork and writing, I've examined many media artifacts that have emerged out of ethnic conflicts where the presence of material deficiency become, deficiencies becomes a crucial index for registering the violence of living in a contact zone. Yet what is going to happen when contemporary acts of violence, from predictive policing to the execution of a lethal drone strike, assume a wholly computational character and no longer generate any of the perceptual contours that would formally allow us to recognize them as image events. Certainly the operations of data aggregation and machine learning that render information actionable and which result in manifold forms of violence is indifferent to the representational forces that might, oth might, that might otherwise work to galvanize public opinion or mobilize a critical response in spite of the fact that there is no guarantee that such empathic attachments will change anything. I say all this, I say this all the while bearing in mind that the violence embedded in big data and numbers is not to be identified solely with warfare, but works across data infrastructures to, incu to include quotidian practices of credit scoring, biometric sampling, consumer marketing, and health insurance determinations to name but a few. Numeric data is of course also frequently and expressly used to signal the escalation and gravity of a disaster or crisis. But even then, the abstract nature of statistics needs to be translated into intelligible and persuasive formats, something usually achieved when numbers ach reach a scalar tipping point. The representation of the refugee crisis has in a sense been much more numeric than visual in character, a literal sea of numbers attended by a growing body count.
In response to public anger at the image of a dead child splashed across the covers of the global press in September 2015, the German tabloid Bild decided to print a page without any images of Alan Kurdi or Elaine or Alan Chenu, as which was his actual name, in quote, as a tribute to the power of photography. Bild's editor in chief stated, Without pictures, the world would be more ignorant, the needy even more invisible, more lost. Many crimes would simply be forgotten without visual reminders, he said, pointing to other shocking images that have had an impact on public opinion from Rwanda to Vietnam to Srebrenica. He went on, the spaces where photos would have been placed are today here instead filled by gray boxes and shapes. We can see that there. This strategy of the void, or withdrawal from the field of representation, has been used many times now by mainstream media. For example, on the cover of the Spanish newspaper La Razón in response to the 2017 attacks in Barcelona, as well as by the independent newspaper here in the UK. With the 2004 killing of British aid worker Alan Henning, the UK government even went so far as to suggest that the very act of watching the Islamic State execution video could be deemed a criminal act punishable under law. Now this is now the case with the passing of the Counterterrorism and Border Security Act of 2019. So one click and you're effectively out, that is to say deported. On October 5th, the Independent ran a cover with a black square designating an unimaginable image with the caption, which you can read, on Friday, a decent, caring human being was murdered in cold blood. Our thoughts are with his family. He was killed on camera for the sole purpose of propaganda. Here's the news, not the propaganda. In attributing extraordinary moral powers, excuse me, in attributing, in attributing extraordinary moral powers of persuasion to images, Article 13 of the Geneva Convention, and which I won't delve into that now, confirms the consequential nature of images as potential instruments of political violence, such that their production and circulation must be closely monitored by the state. Certain kinds of images are considered so morally reprehensible that they must be barred or withdrawn from domestic circulation and are even subject to legal sanction in order to ensure a media blackout. Whereas others, such as the Independence cover that ran several months later with the caption, the unmasking of a British butcher, circulated widely and literally emphasized revelation. So who we are invited to look at, empathize with, or conversely turn away in disgust or despair is part of the political and ideological, ideological economies of both abstraction and representation. Yet new modes of abstraction in the form of computational events problematize this relationship further still. I'm just, I'm gonna conclude shortly. The cooling thermal image that, initiated, that initiates my talk offers a potent example of this condition because through it we can access the traumatic dimensions of militarized abstraction as a paradoxically ungrounded space in which representations can no longer hold fast to the reality effects of war, nor produce their conventional public moral narratives. I say paradoxical because it is after all the becoming ground of the figure the one who bled out on screen that so disturbs Bryant in its monochromatic and excessive formlessness. He remembers every pixel and is horrified. Every undifferentiated electronic quadrant is a placeholder for a death that was momentarily fully present on screen, but is now ungraspable and seemingly unknowable, just another classified deletion on the kill list. Yet to focus upon Bryant's televisually induced despair is to, gra un is to grant undue privilege to the subjectivity and sovereign gaze of the perpetrator whose act of killing is repeated through the technical and visual abolition of the figure into the digital abstraction of the ground. So this raises a question that I have no answer for, which is, is our only recourse to justice is our only recourse to justice to, in effect, humanize the pixel or the data point, 
to heighten our sense of, sense of ethical resolution so that the body doesn't seemingly disappear into the informatic unknown. While computational systems are obviously entangled with human actors, machine learning algorithms have evolved capacities to assume many functions that remove us from the chain of decision making, due in large part to the sheer volume of data that can be scanned and cross-referenced. Assessing the criteria upon which a certain decision was returned by a machine, such as a credit score or the appearance of a name on the kill list, has been come incredibly difficult to ascertain for experts and non-specialists alike. As the front lines increasingly move into the covert spaces of computation and digital abstraction, well beyond the thresholds of human perception and their attendant regimes of publicity, our critical vantage point into conditions of conflict must also shift. Screen space has multiplied and refracted the frames of war into a complex field of sensors, software and servers that track their targets, combatants, capital and consumers across the electromagnetic spectrum. Investigating digitized and automated forms of contemporary violence will require a conceptual realignment in which we learn to attend to the specificity of struggles that are also working themselves out at the level of processing from translations between file formats, signal latency, compression artifacts, and data remnants to the disclosures of metadata. Cameras and media have long ventured into conflict zones, exposing injustice and documenting violations. However, the expansion of these zones into powerful computational arrangements must bring about new decoding practices if we are to intervene politically into the electronic fields of weaponized data where algorithms execute and pixels cover up a crime. So I'm gonna leave it there, so thank you. Susan. Um, I will now introduce Omar Brada and Reem Shadid. Um, they will join us in a conversation. Um, Omar Brada is a writer and curator and the director of the Dar al Mamun, a library um, and artist residency in Marrakesh. He organized public pro program at Centre Pompidou, hosted shows on the French National Radio, ran Tangier's International Book Salon. He recently edited The Africans, um, a book on migration and racial politics in Morocco. Um, in 2016, he created exhibitions at Marrakesh Biennale, centering on the work and archive of writer and filmmaker Ahmed Bonani, whose posthumous history of Moroccan cinema he's currently editing. Um, he will be in conversation with Reem Shadid is a curator and deputy director of Sharjah Art Foundation, where she manages the year-round exhibitions and public programs, as well as the publications, film, music, education, and community outreach programs. Um, she works closely with artists and curators to mount major exhibition, including the biennials, and to coordinate commissions and productions. So please join me in welcoming Omar and Reem.
Can anyone, can everyone hear me? Yes. So thank you, Anna, for the introduction and Moad for the invitation and thank you all for being here. Uh, I feel like I got tricked today uh, because Reem decided not to give a talk and I have to give a talk and then we will discuss. Uh, these are just some notes. Uh, Mu'ad wanted me to speak about Ahmed Bournani, who's a Moroccan writer and filmmaker I've been working on for a while, who died in 2011. I will do that in a minute, but I first wanted to share with you some impressions. They're, they're a little disorganized, and um, maybe you can help me with them, uh, but they're impressions of an exhibition that is currently uh, in New York, from where I have arrived last night and I might be babbling a bit because of jet lag. Uh, the exhibition is Theater of Operations, The Gulf Wars, 1991-2011. Has anybody seen it here in the room? A couple of people, not a lot of people. Uh, it's at MoMA PS1. It's a huge, sprawling exhibition that occupies the whole museum. It's curated by Ruba Katrib and Peter Ely. Um, and I have, so I haven't studied it carefully, uh, and I haven't even seen the whole thing because it's massive, but it kind of fascinated and puzzled me a bit. Uh, it's an interesting show in the context of this symposium because it reflects on different regimes of image production, consumption in relation to war, destruction, propaganda, etc. It also has two works by Harun Farouki, War at a Distance and Serious Games 3, Immersion. And the first work I saw when I visited the exhibition was uh, this one, uh, a large wall installation by Maha Malala, uh, composed of many smaller pictures. So some of them look like portraits, uh, others are numbers, and then there are these brass, polished brass plates. Uh, and it's a, it's a work that is a kind of, um, let me look for the title of the work. Oh, it's, oh, yeah. <laughs> he, she has no picture. That's the title of the work. Um, it's from 2019, but it's something she's worked on for 28 years, so since 1991 when she was living in Iraq. And it's a work that references um, uh, the bombing of a civilian shelter uh, of uh, Al Amriya, uh, a shelter in a neighborhood in Baghdad in 1991 by the Allied forces. In that bombing, 408 people died, so it's a, the largest number of casualties in that kind of situation there. Um, and so she visited the site a couple of months later, and uh, the families of the victims had um, put in photographs of, of the victims. They published a little booklet with the names of all 408 people and the photographs of about 100 of them. There weren't photographs of, of everyone. And when there were no photographs, it would say, la surata lahu, he or she, or laha, he or she has no picture. Um, she wanted to take photos, but she didn't have access to film. There is a question of scarcity of materials of production and of image production that is really interesting in this exhibition because the exhibition has a number of Iraqi artists from Iraq and from the diaspora and a number of Western, especially American artists. And the kind of the, the types of the work, the, the materiality of the works, if you compare them, is, is extremely interesting. Um, so what she did is she recreated a number of the portraits, but by using, by making collages of these, of um, burnt pieces of fabric. Um, this and these are the, the brass plates with uh, he or she has no picture here. So right across from this work uh, on the opposite wall was a work by Louise Lawler, so American artist. Um, this is the, sorry about the pictures, they're just pictures I took uh, quickly. 
Uh, it's called No Official Estimate, Sun Sol, 2004-2007. And it's these six um, uh, chromogenic color prints. Um, and there's text on the wall in between them. You can't really see it very well, but it's just a little number each time between them. And the number refers to uh, an alleged number of victims of the, um, uh, in Iraq, victims of, uh, or uh, consequences of the American invasion. And what you see in the pictures here, they're all entirely black, uh, except for this ray on the side, which is, um, I quote, sunlight passing through two window panes and hitting a wall drawing by the artist Soloit. And so then the numbers between each picture are very different from each other. They just come from different sources. And the reference here is to the fact that the US government never kept official tallies of Iraqi casualties. Um, the one general said famously, we have already buried them. They can no longer be counted. We don't make those kinds of calculations. Um, so the, the work is kind of aesthetically pleasing. It has good intentions. But she kind of stops there. She stops at the numbers or the lack of numbers. Um, the, what it was made especially puzzling by the kind of interface or interaction or the, the, the fact of placing it across from the Maha Malala. Um, it, it gave me this kind of uneasy impression that the artist was unable, perhaps, to take her own subject matter seriously or that she was perhaps involuntarily reducing it to a set of numbers or an absence of numbers. Uh, the subject, the subject of slain Iraqis, disappeared behind the smooth seriality of its sleek production. And what stands out is the reference to solo it, in a way. Uh, there was something missing, something like uh, a point of connection, something of the kind that Farroki was aiming at, perhaps in his 1969 Inextinguishable Fire. A lot of you will know this film, but just as a re quick <coughs> reminder, the film was made in 69. It references the, the Vietnam War. He starts by reading a letter from a Vietnamese a victim of a napalm attack, and he then he has some comments about, you know, would I show you the image of a victim, what would it make you feel to see that violence? Would you react to it? Would you close your eyes? Would you turn away, et cetera? So the, the kind of aporias of the image are of showing violence. And then what he does is you see his right hand um, going off screen and coming back with a cigarette with which he burns his, his left arm. And, and he goes on to a comment about a comparison between the heat at which a cigarette burns and the heat of a of napalm. So he, he burns himself in one point of his body, and that point of his body relates to the world in this way. Um, and I felt in the Louise Lawler work and in a lot of the works in that exhibition in New York that that point of connection was missing somehow, that um, a lot of the works were kind of hovering um, over a reality they were not touching. Uh, and I may be um, unfair. <laughs> but there's a work by Alan Sekula in the show uh, that goes along an essay he wrote about a war without bodies. And it seems to me the question of the, of the body was posing itself insistently in this exhibition. So I was finding this curatorially puzzling and wondering why, what it meant on the part of PS1 to put these two works across from each other. <coughs> the, the, and, and this kind of informed my visit of the whole exhibition. There seemed to be, from uh, on the side of the Western artists in the exhibition, a kind of fascination with TV. I mean, of course, this was the Iraq war, so. There's a lot of TV, a lot of the, there was a lot of video pieces in the work and a lot of them felt like CNN on a loop. Um, and, and I mentioned the, the question of the difference of, of materiality. Upon second inspection, um, 
when you look again, it seemed to me that uh, Mahamalala defended herself quite well. As you see, each the two works kind of reflect each other, and it looks here like she's saying that Louise Lawler has no image. <laughs> And so that made me think as I was walking around the show that perhaps these kinds of pairings were not uh, accidental because there suddenly seemed to be many of them and I attribute it to the perverse genius of Roba Katrib's curating, maybe. I don't know if she would agree. I haven't spoken to her about this. But for like, just a few quick, quick examples. This is Tariq al Hussein. He was away, he was in, in Egypt and watching TV and he made these Polaroids of TV screens that uh, have a kind of, th th some of them are blurry, some of them are uh, intimate, some of them, they, they are different, they give a kind of complex, uh, their accumulation gives a kind of complex emotional or subjective idea of a lived, uh, a lived experience of the conflict, even as seen through TV. And across from it is this Richard Hamilton huge picture called War Games. Um, there is a set of drawings by Raith Abdul Ahad. Abdul Ahad. Uh, this is the only one I could find a picture of online. I forgot to take pictures during the exhibition. It says Iraqi men detained south of Baghdad during a US army raid. Some of them are much more detailed and their titles are very uh, interesting because they, they name a place, they name a date, they name numbers of people. They're very specific in their portrayal and in their the memory they're trying to preserve. Uh, and in the same room is this work by Rachel Khadouri called Untitled. A lot of the Western works are untitled, have these very simple, simple abstracted titles, Iraq Book Project. And what this project is, is over a certain period of time um, after the beginning of the Iraq War, it's a printout of the text of every news article uh, that makes a reference to the Iraq war. So it's, it's this kind of uh, several, I mean, each book is a thousand pages and there are 70 of them. And so it's this kind of endless scroll of media text um, on the war. Uh, nearby is a work by Thomas Hirschhorn. Uh, I'm not showing pictures, it's called Touching Reality and it's five minutes of somebody with an iPad kind of zooming into uh, images, very violent images of, of destroyed bodies, essentially. So it's like this um, <coughs> frenzy of watching violence. Um, and so it's kind of, it seems to be a reaction to, to the abstraction in a way. He's like, let's face, let's face these images of the violence we have uh, created. Um, so it's, so it's, most of the works were devoid of bodies, and when there were bodies, there were these kind of very, very horrifically mutilated bodies. And not far from it responded this work by Dia Azawi, which, which is this diptych. One of them is a press image of uh, um, a completely destroyed face of an Iraqi soldier, which he repainted um, to give it some dignity back, let's say. So this, this made me think of uh, a little passage in an Ahmed Bu'anani poem in this book, The Shutters. It says, forgive me and to the devil with you. Love, admire, detest as you see fit. My factory has no robots. My machines are on strike. The waves of my ocean speak a language that is not yours. Forgive me and to the devil with you. I am dead and you accuse me of living. I smoke second-rate cigarettes, and you accuse me of, feud of burning feudal farms. Listen, listen to me. So Buanani was born in 1938. He died in 2011. Uh, this is a picture that was taken in 2009 by a filmmaker, Ali Safi, who did the documentary film on him, <coughs> and who was one of the few people who've had uh, recorded, sustained, conversations with him, in ca on camera at least. He was a writer, a filmmaker, a film editor by training. He, um, this is one of his published books, Les Persiennes, which became very recently The Shutters in English. He designed his own film posters. This is Asarab, The Mirage, his um, feature film from 79. Um, he, uh, he was a man who did a bit of everything because <coughs> 
you know, he felt that whatever he was, when he felt that what he was looking for was not around, he just did it. Um, he was one of the contributors to Souffle, Breaths, and Fez, which was um, kind of a major writers and artists kind of magazine, started in 1966 with the project of across North Africa and then kind of with larger geographic ambitions, uh, working towards what they called cultural decolonization in the wake of formal decolonizations. Um, so he is he's somebody who had um, <coughs> pretty central position in a kind of post-independence Moroccan artistic scene, especially in terms of writing and film, but who became forgotten after the after the eighties, let's say, and, and there's been a few of us trying to work on his archive and figure out this disappearance and um, and bring it back, bring his work back to light. His, I wanted to show a small excerpt from a film of his called Memory 14 that's um, contempt that was made the same year as Farroqui's um, Inextinguishable Fire uh, in the late 60s. One of the reasons I wanted to show this film is that it's a rare example, maybe the, only, the at least the first example in Morocco of a montage film. It's a film where he was trying to write a filmic history of Morocco, at least of the colonization period, so from the early 20th century to 56. Uh, and the only way he could do that, or the only moving images available of that time period, are images shot by the French as they were conquering and colonizing. Um, they are images, so images made by the enemy, and not only images that documented the destruction of a world, but images that contributed to that destruction. So he was trying to find a way of, of using those images against themselves or against their own design, appropriating them and making them uh, speak differently. So he would cut them, resequence them, eliminate the soundtrack, which would be this propaganda voiceover, uh, change it completely, add music, add a voiceover that is more a poetic text that he wrote. One of his lines says that eyes are no longer enough. Les yeux ne suffisent plus. And not only is he using the, those kinds of documentary images repurposed, um, that were the, the French images, he's also producing new images that come to complement them. He shot images on the same uh, locations. So his new images comment on the other images as well. I'll just show you a three minute excerpt. Sorry for the quality.
aussi nombreuses que les brins que je file sont mes peines, et aussi longues que le fil que déroule mes doigts. Okay, so we'll stop there. Uh, it's it's difficult to see just a short excerpt of the, like this because it's the the construction of the whole thing is all of these motifs that come back and rhyme with each other in a way the kind of the clock ticking, the um, folkloric music, the close ups, the army marches, uh, and all of that. Um, and it's partly a question of framing. I mean, one of the things that Buonani says or said is that he felt a, first of all, I should say that this footage he found, he actually, it wasn't readily available. What happened was in the context of this kind of long extended period of becoming independent or decolonizing, which is obviously not over, the, the French had built in the, I mean, during the colonial period, uh, s film studios, the Suisse studios in Rabat, where they would produce all of their propaganda and also other types of film, and those studios were closed in 66 and dismantled. And the material that was in it was not preserved in any proper way, so he just found these reels on, on the floor, essentially, uh, in the street. And being the geek that he was, he just took everything and uh, worked with it. Uh, but he, f he noticed that most of the, in, in most of them, the French were framing them, were shooting the Moroccans from afar, either from afar, so no individualization, or just as this kind of mass of people, always like these big groups of people. And the overwhelming impression that he had was that the film was really made to give the impression of this country in chaos that the you know, army of the French people were coming to, to discipline or to pacify, as they said. So, so one, one of the points of his cutting and resequencing is to, to show armies coming and, and people resisting in a way. Um, in spite of the narrative that was created by these images in the first place. Um, and then he decided he needed to insert uh, other images, so the close-ups of the old faces, which are old villagers who had witnessed that kind of invasion 60 years earlier in the same place. Um, he is showing what the colonizer obviously didn't care to film or could not have filmed, the silent worry, the panicked solidarity, the quiet craft, um, like a corrective or an addendum to recorded history. By filming the elders and reinserting them into the history of their own demise, he perhaps helps them recover a kind of silent dignity. And you notice the soundtrack kind of becomes silent at those moments. They look the camera in the eye they scrutinize us as though they had one last request. And then, no, they don't look us in the eye. It is too late. They entrust us, perhaps, with these images of their own life's trauma. They silently guide us toward the significance of this reframing of the colonial archive. They are here to testify to Buranani's integrity as a filmmaker historian. He, Buranani mentioned somewhere that a lot of the reels were in very bad shape. Uh, and you see it here a little bit. This is also because this is a compressed version that I for for the PowerPoint. But that he had to fix the the reels almost image by image, an extremely painstaking process, in which there's an incredible irony because it was imperative for him to restore and preserve the documents of our own destruction in order to buy the this work of editing and re-editing and reframing in order to symbolically destroy them again in, in a way. Um, let's see, just want to conclude. Um, and he's, one of the other things that he does that may not be as um, uh, obvious in the excerpt I showed, I mean, the, I ended on this clip of the women weaving, uh, and which is a kind of a metaphor for the interlocking strands or, or, and threads of the film, but it's also more than just his showing, he was very insistent on showing the crafts, for instance, those kinds of crafts, but also on 
um, using traditional popular music and also in the voiceover, there is a kind of appeal to the storyteller's craft. He uses expressions that storytellers on, on public spaces use as though he was annexing maybe the colonial images, formally speaking, formally annexing them within the telling of something like a, a traditional story, like an oral story. Um, a halqa, halqa is the storytelling circle. Uh, it's invoked more than once, um, uh, especially for instance in the voiceover, it says expand the circle, which is what a storyteller would say. Expand the circle, may God expand your tombs. May the poet and the storyteller be blessed. May our song be worthy of those who listen to it. And in the narration, history in the film is not referred to by years, by dates, uh, by, by specific historical events, though you can recognize specific historical events if, if you know the history, but it's referred to by folk cycles or mythological cycles. It says the year of the locust, the year of the sword and the cannon, the year of the good season. So it's kind of like pitting a kind of vernacular time um, against chronological um, history and and framing it with a kind of poetic language rather than um, you know rather than an essay or a pedagogical kind of commentary on the images um, what I wanted to end on is the fact that a lot of this few people have seen this film including in Morocco for several reasons uh, one is that it you know it's not been distributed much. Another thing to say is that it was heavily censored. This was a project for a feature film. He made a film that was a, um, 108 minutes long. And for one month, for one entire month, he had every morning to go sit with the censorship committee. And as he says, they asked me to explain the links between each, each image, essentially. And they ended up cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting. And what we have now is 24 minutes out of 108. All the rest has been destroyed. Part of it has to do with the fact that he was also telling history, for instance, of the um, uprising in the Reef Mountains in the 20s, where the French and Spanish colonial armies were defeated. And Abdelkrim Khattabi established what was called as the Republic of the Reef. And in the Morocco of the 60s and 70s, any mention of a republic, even in the past, was something that just could not happen. So Buonanio found himself kind of stuck between two, two forms of authority, right? The colonial one with these images of violence that is all that is left and with which we can retell a history, um, but also their history books, their ethnographic studies and all of that, the internalized self-hatred. Um, and the current, at his time, authority of the nascent modern nation state that was fashioning a unified national narrative to serve its own purposes. So he wasn't necessarily trying to reestablish something like factual truth. He was rather trying to, I think, to find new modes of narrating a complex history, um, uh, modes of narrating that may be less tied to considerations of fact uh, and of dates, as I said, then to fables and oral histories, a certain kind of vernacular modernism, you could call it. And I just wanted to show you just a couple more images of um, his archive. He's somebody, so because of all the censorship, because of the difficulty of producing, because of not being so interested in being in the limelight, he is someone who kind of retreated from the scene in, in some sometime in the early 80s. And, um, and then got forgotten. I mean, I only became aware of him just before he died. And, um, and I thought, like many people, that the four books he published, the one feature film and the few short films we have of him were the only thing he had done. But in fact, he worked all his life, except he didn't publish or show or share. And so his apartment was full of these dozens and dozens of finished uh, manuscripts that a few of us are trying to uh, bring to, to light. Um, also, kind of tragically, before, uh, this was during his lifetime, in 2006, his apartment caught fire. We don't quite know the reason, but some of his archive um, was destroyed, uh, which is a kind of iron irony for somebody who spent his whole life kind of trying to reframe and save a certain kind of, of memory. Um, so I've been kind of republishing some of his work, did a few exhibitions that take his archive as a starting point and try to put it in conversation with the work of contemporary Moroccan artists. How does this work, these questions that were 
being asked in the 60s and 70s by him and other you know, writers and artists, um, and that got completely silenced or censored by a couple of decades of, of uh, uh, strong political tyranny. Uh, you know, and how can they be open today and what kind of conversation can be created with them? So same thing, kind of translations of his work, republications of his, of his uh, books, the latest one being this one, which is a book he wrote in the 80s that was never published. It's called The Seventh Gate, A History of Film in Morocco from 1907 to 1986. Um, it's, th we don't have a good history of film in Morocco. I believe this is it. It's a little dated because it's from the 80s. Uh, but it's fascinating because, as I said earlier, when he felt that something was not there, he would just do it. A journalist asked him in the early 90s, but why, are you, why did you write a history of film in Morocco? He said, well, I really didn't want to do it, but nobody was doing it, so I had to. And it's an incredibly painstaking work. I mean, it's, it's almost 400 pages. It's, he, look, he watched every film. He looked, he studied all the credits of all the films. He was looking at when, what types of actors entered the scene and what types of colonial movies. And he starts with this whole part that he calls the colonial night of all the films that Europeans shot in Morocco before independence and that he thinks was a, it, that it was very important to look um, into it because that shaped a certain image of the country. And the second part, which is the longer part, is kind of this narrative of the Im impossible constitution of a self-image of sorts. And I will... The book ends on an anecdote that I will just uh, tell you. It's the last paragraph of the book, and he says, one day I was traveling to Tangier with my daughter on a train, and the train was overflowing with people, and we found ourselves sitting cramped in fourth class. I mean, apparently at the time it was fourth class on trains. And his daughter, who was a, a small girl, said, it, this, this feels like a Western movie. The Indians might attack soon. And he says, not to worry, darling, the Indians are us. Thank you. Oh, now it's on, I think. Okay. Um, thank you, Omar. Um, so, I just wrote down some notes and some examples that I came across and thought would be interesting to start a discussion mm -hmm. um, following your talk and just based on you know, the conversation we had uh, earlier this week. Um, there are examples from moving image works and some of which you mentioned, uh, but also references in writing and publishing practices because of what I think are some of the similarities uh, between the two, the, these two domains and how they deal with various issues. So I'll just list some of, um, mm -hmm. some of these examples. Um, in 1955, during its colonization of Algeria, the French declared a state of emergency. Article 11 of this legislation allowed French authorities to control the press, publications, and radio in order to control an anti-colonial narrative coming out of Algeria and France. One of the publications heavily targeted was the French communist newspaper Le Humanité, who at times would feature a full blank page in place of articles denouncing the use of torture or war crimes by the French army and police. So a newspaper without articles. Um, as for the Ar Algerian publications during that period, they opted to stay um, out of the colonial empire structure to keep their power and avoid being censored so their editing offices and printing were based in Tunis and their publications were hand carried into Algeria and distributed. Um, the late Syrian filmmaker, Omar Amilalai, um, 
who his work was the cent was at the center of a cinema and uh, politics program in 1978 in France. The organizers chose 18 films, but the Syrian government had banned more than half of them. So instead of canceling the participation of these films or not showing them, the French critic Serge Janet, who was uh, one of the organizers, sat <coughs> on the stage and narrate, narrated, narrated detailed description of them, so a screening without an image. In the example that you just, uh, well not the example, in the work of Barnani in um, Memoir 14 that you just talked about and um, you showed us a clip of, and how heavily censored it was, um, the use of colonial propaganda imagery and the addition of what I understand is his own footage of the close-up of faces and, and hands and and also the text that he read, which is actually from from the which is a long poem of his, yeah. Yeah, from from it, um, produced a work that is actually critical of the government and it, what it was trying to say at the time. But somehow, those twenty four minutes were still allowed at the end. So it also made me think of um, whether it was because the government did not necessarily understand the significance of his editions, or perhaps it was actually calculated and a calculated acceptance on behalf of, on behalf of the government. So this is something that I also come mm -hmm. to a little bit later. Um, going back to Omar Anrelai, in 2003, um, he produced a film that revisits a propaganda film that he made in the 1970s, his first film actually. Um, where he speaks about, in his later film, 2003, he speaks about his naivety of believing in the mission of the Ba'ath Party and producing the first film that actually supports it. Um, after producing many films between 1970 and 2003 that were actually banned by the Syrian regime, Amir Lai understood that in order for his 2003 film, um, which was titled uh, Floods in Ba'ath Country, to be allowed to be shown, it had to seem supportive of the regime. So he used footage from his initial propaganda film, along with new footage that he took and interviews that he did in a tiny town, tiny town of Al Mashi in Syria. Um, the film follows this tiny town um, as a micro microcosm of the Ba'ath regime. Uh, the edit of the film and the visual repetition of the f of the support of the Ba'ath regime shows instead of a celebrated socialist system, actually an, op an oppressive autocracy. That's what comes out from like the constant repetition. Mm -hmm of celebrating the Ba'ath regime, which is what the film um, does. So basically, like, it managed to, um, to erase what is seemingly supportive and actually substituting a different um, story or a different kind of uh, critical outlook on it. Um, so next door, just in the exhibition, Kamal al-Jafari's appropriation of, image, uh, of images in his film recollection. Um, where he basically takes um, footage from Hollywood and Israeli films in order to reconstruct the memory and image of the stolen city of Yaffa. He manipulates the images, um, blurs them, slows them down, slows their time, um, tr basically revealing um, that which is hidden in the frame in order to also um, tell a different history of this, um, of this city. So these examples in their different ways highlight this practice of reconstructing, reconstructing other historical narratives <laughs> through basically appropriation, repeti repetition, and um, omission. So this, um, for me, of course, raises the question of how can these appropriated and manipulated um, images and their, like what is their role in basically subverting um, state-imposed narratives and, and imagery, and how do we assess them? So also issues of circulating, circulation and distribution, which you also talked about in Barnani. I will continue, and then we can um, in an interview that I read, uh, speaking of her experience around publishing critical content in today's Egypt, Yuna Atallah, who is the co-founder of Mada Masr, an online newspaper from Egypt that is blocked in Egypt and its employees is, are subject to constant harassment from the government, speaks of the idea of building power versus taking it. Um, she believes that during seeming times of defeat um, is the only time that you can really build power because Normally, during revolutionary eruptions, um, that eruption can basically trump the possibility of building counter powers. So this is just generally about um, power. So it also made me think of what are these tools that are used to build power and narratives. And I saw building narratives as actually also a way of building um, power. 
Um, so how do, like basically how is that done? Um, and of course, something that we should really consider in this is the timing um, that this is done and proximity. So if we think about the filmmakers, um, the work of the filmmakers, Farouqi, of course, but also Jafari, Amiralai, and Barnani, um, whose practices um, or the images fr from their practices were basically excavated but highlighted at a later time or basically were coming out or distributed or being circulated at a, at a later time almost for a different generation. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this that we're looking at now, which was made in the 70s and 60s, mm -hmm. um, so it puts forward the question around basically timing and proximity and its ability to build power. Um, and I know this also came up in our conversation yesterday with Naeem and Maad at, at, um, at Gorky's this season also. Um, in the same kind of vein of thinking about building power, um, I thought it would be interesting to also consider how these filmmakers um, um, and, and the forms that they use to basically like kind of subvert these narratives and produce images um, new images that tell other narratives, which I talked about earlier, um, but also serve to question the structures that put us in the position of descent and shaped our modes of resistance in certain ways. So in a way, the question becomes around whether we are submitting unknowingly to what has already been accounted for by authoritarian regimes, or are we really kind of building these narratives of power and subverting them? So this is, this is also about yeah, the degrees of what we're doing, kind of acts of subversion or, or um, yeah, telling different histories. And I think this also goes back to circulation and distribution, of thinking about circulation and distribution and timing. Um, and then I had some questions that were um, around Barnani specifically and the use of language. Um, so actually the, the um, Inextinguishable fire that you also mentioned um, for Farouki and like the, the his use of him actually sitting directly in front of the camera and um, and basically speaking to um, to the to the spe spectator basically um, and then basically also the self inflicting knee injury um, I was there was a question there around the language that he uses to frame kind of basically this. The self-inflicted injury, and how it acts to like almost negate the possibility of, of experiencing it as a minimalist gesture, which I think I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. Um, but also, it brings up questions of how basically these images also obscure and destroy as much as they depict, which I, which Susan also mentioned in her um, in her talk. Um, so this is also around like kind of the question of editing and the use of image, but also the use of language. So. I was also thinking about the works of Barnani um, and his use of um, language or the introduction of close-ups that provide the audience with a different proximity. Um, and I think that's it. I mean, I also had something, and I know that we talked about this, um, around um, curating as editing mm. um, and thinking um, thinking about the examples that you gave from theater of, of uh, operations um, with the different works. Um, and then thinking about how this material, what is the significance of all this material now, and basically in a way like how can we edit, you know, imagery or, or content that is, has been circulated just into the present. I think that's it. Okay. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot in what you said. Maybe I can respond to some of it. Um, maybe people in the room have responses or further questions too. I mean, uh, uh, I'm sure we're open to that. Um, yeah, I was um, interested in what you said. You know, it, it was a 108-minute film; only 24 minutes remain. But but 24 minutes do remain, and so how come that was not censored? Uh, it's a good question. I don't I don't really know. I've, I don't think I have been. Uh, in front of a censorship committee or like people who are supposed to judge the acceptability of images. I don't know. 
I don't know what, what, how they think. I mean, in, in, in this book, actually, which has not been published yet, I think you're the first people to see the cover. This is actually Barnani's wife who played um, a, a role in one of his other films, uh, Naima Barnani. She was a costume maker and a set designer and uh, sometimes an actress. And so he, he tells in that book the story of another film he was editing, because he edited other people's films as well. That's what his training was as an editor. So he's kind of, he was kind of the editor of Moroccan <coughs> cinema. And he sometimes had to um, be in front of that censorship committee, not for his own films, but for films he was editing for some reason. And he tells the story of, of um, something that the, the censors were not liking at all that had to do with the fact that, well, in one anecdote, he was like, you could, there is a free, it's, um, I think it was supposed to be a documentary film that had some nationalist overtones to maybe a visit of the king somewhere. And then at a certain point, there's a frame on, um, what do you call them? Uh, shoe shiners, shoe, is that how you call them? Shoe shiners. Uh, and, and you were not supposed to show, you know, like people sitting close to the floor shining shoes in a film like that. So they were having him remove that. And there was another instance where he says, well, th there, is a, there was some faces you'd see from fairly close by and the censors found them ugly and you couldn't see, you know, the, uh, those ugly faces in that film. And he said, I didn't erase that passage. I just resequenced. Um, and the faces stopped being ugly. So there, there are a lot of ways in which, and I, I assume that in the process of making Memoir 14, it wasn't just, what we have is not just what remains after the rest was destroyed. I think he reworked it. I mean, whenever they would take something away, he would have to make, again, something that made sense. He, he says that the, the um, Memoir 14 is a long poem here, and he sometimes speaks of the film as a tra translation, a visual translation of this long poem. So the poem came first, uh, in a way. Uh, and the film is always more than just a film, or always more than just a visual. The sound plays a huge role, the, the, the words that are spoken. It's kind of a, in that sense, the documentary aspect of it is, is, is more than I mean, documentary or not documentary is not a question. It's kind of striving towards a, a truth that is a, comp a multi-layered composite of all of these elements of, of poem and visual and sound and all of that. And so he would have to recompose a film each time, and then it would get shortened, and he would recompose a film. He would cut from the poem. He would rewrite the poem. Um, so I'm not sure the process by which something becomes acceptable, but I know that it, it took a really long time and that, that he almost let go of it. Uh, at a certain point, uh, or maybe maybe it is what's left because they they got tired of sitting down with him and <laughs> and uh, he stood firm, right? Um, the one funny, I don't know if it's funny, but an anecdote that Ali Safi likes to tell is that um, the the main person who was uh, insistent on censoring Barnani was a guy called Omar Ghannam, who was the director of the National Film Center in Rabat, Morocco. One thing to know is that Barnani was part of a generation of young filmmakers, mostly trained in Europe, so some in France, some in Poland, some in other places. Uh, in his case, he spent two years in France learning film editing from 61 to 63 when he was in his early 20s, and he went back right away. And after a, an initial, a first job he had for a couple of years, which was interesting, uh, interestingly a job with an organization that went around Morocco documenting um, you know, crafts, oral traditions, and all of that. Um, he joined the National Film Center uh, for as a day job. That was his full-time job. He was an editor at the National Film Center. And that, that National Film Center uh, was also the main body of production for movies. That's where, you know, that's where you went to get money for films. And in fact, most films were commissioned. So there would be these young filmmakers went back to Morocco. They were all employees of the National Film Center, and they would be asked to go, uh, you know, make a movie on this town or this region or this process of electrification or this or this or that, kind of this, as part of the construction of this national narrative. And what somebody like Bornani would do is that sometimes he would try and use that request or commission to try and make a film of his own under the guise of making the, the national documentary thing. And so it would work or not work, would be censored, not censored. And then they had the opportunity after a few years to start 
um, applying for funds for their own personal projects, of which this was one. Um, there's another interesting experiment that they did and that didn't last. Is Barnani and three, three others, three or four others, in the late 60s started a cooperative production company called Sigma 3. They each put a, a little bit of money and then looked for money elsewhere. And, and they were all filmmakers, and the idea is that they would work collectively on films. So he had his feature film, The Mirage, the, the Sarab that I showed earlier, was supposed to be one of the films produced by this cooperative. The first one and the only one that they produced is called Weshma. Uh, the, I don't know what the title in, in English is for Weshma, but uh, it's like, it translates as the tattoo, or, the, or tr I think it's, it's uh, the actual title is Traces or something like that. Um, but, uh, and it came out in 1970, and it's, uh, it's considered as kind of the first, you know, real, um, auteur Moroccan film. Uh, and Bouanani is technically the editor of the film. Um, in any case, so the, that collective produced one feature film and then dissolved because of, you know, I guess the, the complicated circumstances that it wouldn't make sense to get into. Um, so for, for the longest time, like all filmmakers in there were stuck with this body, body that was the, pro the produ producing body, but also the censoring body. And, um, and the anecdote I was going to tell about Omar Ghannam, so Omar Ghannam was the director of the National Film Center. He somehow had decided that Bouhanani was a bad guy. They accused him of being a communist, which is a, a little strange because he was never, I mean, he was probably an anarchist, but com communist sounds strange. He was, in any case, he was never involved with any party politics of any sort. But anyway, it was a, a way of, uh, taking him down, and they relegated him from the editing department to the archives department, so he was kind of in the basement taking care of archives, which was, of course, amazing for him in some other way. But the, the strange uh, anecdote is that this Rannam guy was in the royal palace in 1971 for a celebration of the king's birthday, and that was one of the of two. That day happened one of two attempted coups against the king, and um, and Ranam, the director of the film center, was killed in that in that um, in that coup. <coughs> so it's uh, the, the 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 interlockings of film and politics were um, very uh, striking then. Um, one other thing I could say in response to your remarks is the uh, Kamal Jafari, I'm, I'm, uh, because that film of Kamal's recollection has clear ties to Memory 14. Um, also because of what, what Kamal called, I think he called this cinematic occupation, right? This, this fact that uh, Jaffa, his city, uh, was was occupied by and through cinema. Uh, it was a place where a lot of, or was one of the major places or sites of filming for Israeli and American films. I think as Chuck Norris right. shot dozens of films there. And all of these action films or films where, you know, that's, that are supposed to, where it's supposed to s stand for Beirut in the Civil War or things like that. and when they would need an explosion or a building to be destroyed on film, they would just destroy an actual building in Jaffa. So the kind of historical, historical fabric of Jaffa architecture was little by little destroyed, not just by Israeli occupation as such, but, but a kind of cinematic occupation over a couple of decades. And the paradox of this, which is a similar paradox to Bornani's paradox of the images of the destruction of a history, a mode of being, uh, et cetera, uh, shot by the French. In this case, the, those fiction films produced in the 60s and 70s and 80s, Yaffa, by Israelis and Americans, are also the only uh, documents of the architecture of Yaffa as it was at the time, So, which, which is, um, uh, then leads to the same story of kind of using them against themselves, right? Inserting characters and then uh, taking away characters. Looking like, I know that Kamal spent weeks, maybe years, I don't know, watching all of these films in order, 
in part to spot, because in all of these films there are no Palestinians, of course, but the thing is that they are shot you know, in, in the city and sometimes in the background you see, you know, okay, like he says, I would recognize my uncle, you know, like just walking by. And so he would zoom in and kind of extract that character of the uncle and give him more of a place in it, etc. But I think also with Tamar, similar to what I'm, uh, what I'm meaning is that there was um, the only, I mean, it's a silent film, but the only um, speaking is actually him asking um, a young girl where her grandmother lives. Oh. And that's the, and I mean, it's the only thing in the whole, um, in the whole film. And I think also this, and I, I think I maybe said something about it, is the also use of language um, within these kind of films that you so I just like I think that's also like a very like yeah. yeah 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 absolutely I mean if if yeah I was trying to think of uh, when I was mentioning an extinguishable fire I was trying to think of, of Faroki who does who, who starts maybe from a position of m mistrust for the images and has his commentary as a kind of mm. articulation of images or a questioning of the images or his own image doing what he's doing uh, Bornani seems to be doing something else which is which is um, which is adding a poetic layer, or like a, a the the link is is looser in a way. Uh, it it's it's it has to go through this this layer of something that is not a direct commentary on the images, and but that is <coughs> um, I didn't speak about this, but in his commentary or poem. And, and it, it does, I mean, it's not a direct commentary on the images, but it does kind of follow them in a way. There's a lot of addressing non-human elements. There's a lot of, there's a focus that I hadn't noticed before. I just noticed when I rewatched the film for today on, for instance, animals. Like you see a lot of violence done to animals in, in the, kind of as part of the colonial conquest uh, in a way uh, that is not something that you necessarily think about. And then you see these, I think in the clip here, you saw the, that man kind of carrying his, uh, what was it, a goat, I think, yeah. and taking it inside. But there's, there's a lot of little bits of images like this. And in the voiceover, there's also, an, um, the voice speaks to the wind. There's a kind of an addressing the wind and asking the wind for things and all of that. So <coughs> Sorry. I mean, there's a lot of things to say, but I think we're running out of time. I don't know if anybody wants to, to say anything. Um. 